to scene one of the Duchess of Malfi. We begin with Bossola and Castruccio on stage. Um, the first bit of this scene is sometimes cut from productions in that it doesn't have any direct bearing on the plot. And that's worth bearing in mind. We can lose the beginning of, of this scene. But there is a bit of Bossola character development, I, I guess, and so it has a role to play. So if you're studying this for A level, uh, this is a part of the scene which you, you ought to be familiar with, uh, particularly as there are some potentially anti feminist elements to it. And I think being able to look at this, this kind of quirky part of Webster's writing it gives you an opportunity to put it in an, an, an historical context because it's so foreign to, to, to what we're familiar with in the theatre in the 21st century in some ways. But I will let you know when we've got to the end of this bit and we've got to the bit where um, the main action of the, of the play resumes. So Bossler comes on with Castruccio, who is one of the courtiers. Uh, he doesn't have an important part to play in, in the play at all. And he says, um, You say you would fain be taken for an eminent courtier. Oh, so you, you, you'd like to be seen as a big shot, would you? Castruccio says, um, Yes, <laughs> tis, tis the very main of my ambition, the essential part of my ambition. Let me see. You have a reasonable good face for it already, and your nightcap expresses your ears sufficiently largely. So, I mean, he's he's joking around here. I would you, uh, I would have you learn to twirl the strings of your band with a good grace, and in a set speech at the end of every sentence to hum three or four times, or blow your nose till it's smart again to recover your memory. When you come to be a president in criminal causes, if you smile upon a prisoner, hang him. But if you frown upon him and threaten him, let him be sure to escape the gallows. So some strange joking advice to Castruccio here, who appears to be oblivious and a bit of a fool. I would be a very merry president. Do not suffer nights. It will beget you an admirable wit. Castruccio continues. Rather it would make me have a good stomach to quarrel, for they say your roaring boys eat meat seldom and that make them so valiant how shall i know whether the people take me for how shall i know the people take me from eminent fellow bosler offers some classic bosler advice here a, a cunning cunning plan i will teach a trick to know it give out you lie a dying and if you hear the common people curse you be sure you are taken for one of the prime nightcaps so in other words let the rumours spread that you're dying and then you'll you'll be able to hear what people really think of you because they'll they'll start saying things that they'll start being less discreet with the things they say about you if they think they're going to you're going to die now the old lady comes on at this point um and i've written here in my notes that in the 21st century we would consider this exchange the one that follows to be in exceptionally bad taste because bosler now proceeds to mock this old lady for her aged appearance and to us in the 21st century that that's wrong and unacceptable and um, just misconceived for all sorts of ideas but 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 we mustn't judge Bossler by the standards of the 21st century um, or, or not exclusively anyway uh, what's what, what is important to remember here is is that this exchange that happens it is is capable of, of being, although it's in bad taste, we often do find things that are in bad taste funny in the right context. And here the context is that we we know Bossler a bit already. We know him and there is plenty to admire about him. And whereas the old lady we, we don't know at all and she is just a stock character. She doesn't have a significant role to play. And so there is something to be said for in enjoying the jokes for their own sake in, in what follows. Bossler says, 
Uh, you come from painting now. The old lady, from what? Why, from your scurvy face physic. To behold thee not painted, inclined somewhat near a miracle. These in thy face here were deep ruts and foul sloughs, the last progress. There, were a lady, uh, there was a lady in France that, having had the smallpox, flayed the skin off her face to make it more level. And whereas before she looked like a nutmeg grater, after she resembled an abortive hedgehog. The old lady doesn't give this much of a response. Do you call this painting? No, no, but you call it careening. Careening is to turn a boat on its side. Of an old morphewed lady, morphewed means scabbed, to make her disembog again, that means empty. Uh, there's a rough cast phrase to your plastic. Really, he's really using his kind of specialised, witty language here. A lot of language which we've abandoned in English. So we're really seeing Bosler at his at his witty best here. Um, so he, he's here he's describing the act, I think, of taking makeup off. So hence the careening, the turning on its side of an old boat and making empty of the face and and this just means there's a rough phrase to your plastic. He's saying that kind of a rough cast phrase, summing it up in one phrase. That's that's what you've been up to. It's, so it's not um, it's not as I said. It's not really particularly pleasant or, or tasteful matter or manner of conversation, old lady. It seems you are well acquainted with my closet. She says. One was suspected for a shop of witchcraft. To find in it the fat of serpents, spawn of snakes, Jews' spittle, and their young children's ordure. So, the in other words, the apparatus of witchcraft. And all these for the face. As in, for the face alone, I think. I would sooner eat a dead pigeon taken from the soles of the feet of one, of one sick of the plague than kiss one of you fasting. Wow, that's pretty inventive and playful for him to invent an insult. As, as much as... As much as one might be tempted to sympathise with the recip with the recipient of such a joke, it is an ingenious, very fluent joke that would um, might well get a laugh from the audience. Here are two of you whose sin of your youth is the very patrimony of the physician. So, the the sin of your youth is the the patrimony, the the pay, the prosperity of the physician, the doctor, makes him renew his foot cloth with the spring and change his high-priced courtesan with the fall of the leaf. In other words, the doctors are rich from the work that you give them from being ill because of the sin of your youth. Um, the doctors are so well off that they can change their expensive prostitutes with the fall of the leaf at the drop of a hat, as they please. So he's being quite crude and uncompromising in his conversation here. Um, but he continues to be very witty and inventive in the way that he executes it. I do wonder you do not loathe yourself. Gosh, that is, is pretty strong. It's, it's quite unsavoury to us now, isn't it? Observe my meditation now. What thing is in this outward form of man? But now he gets a bit more philosophical now. What thing is in this outward form of man? So that's where all this is going, I guess. It is this so far has been... This rather distasteful scene with the old lady, it's been a way into Bossler riffing on a favourite topic of his, which is how we're all going to die. So he's reflecting on mortality and how our bodies are mere flesh and blood that will wither and decay and, and that vanity and so many other things in this life are futile. So here he goes. Observe my meditation now. What thing is this outward form of man, your, your body, to be beloved? What is there to love about the human body? We account it ominous if nature do produce a colt, or a lamb, or fawn, or goat, in any limb resembling a man, and fly from, um, from it as, as a prodigy, as a bizarre um, example of nature. Man stands amazed to see his deformity in any other creature but himself. But in our own flesh, though we bear diseases, 
which have their true names only taken from beasts, as the most ulcerous wolf and swinish measle, though we are eaten up of lice and worms, and though continually we bear about us a rotten and dead body, we delight to hide it in rich tissue. All our fear, nay, our terror, is lest our physician should put us in the ground to be made sweet. I find that a difficult line to explain. I, I think the sweet there is sweet as in pure. So he's saying that it's, it's a futile vanity to spend our lives worrying about these decaying bodies being eaten up by lice and worms. And, and yet our terror is rotting in the ground even though we're, we're all rotting already. That, that seems to be his, his reflection. It's cheery stuff. And then he changes the subject. Your wife's gone to Rome. You two couple and get, get, you, to well, get you to the wells at Lucca to recover your eggs. I have other work on foot. So he kind of dismisses them. And, um, and then the, the scene proper begins. Uh, you do see production to begin it here. I observe our duchess is sick a days. She pukes, her stomach seethes, the fins of her eyelids look most teeming blue. So we see Christopher being observant there, and also giving us a, a portrait of the duchess, which we wouldn't see for ourselves from her being on stage. We'll see that she's she's pregnant, but he's he's kind of showing us the clues that he's he's noticed she wanes in the cheek she's pale and waxes fat in the flank again he's being witty there the moon the moon wanes and waxes so he's just kind of taking that and and, and just using that language uh, to describe the the duchess so waning in the cheek and waxing in the flank so she's she's fleshing out she's pregnant and contrary to or he doesn't know she's pregnant of course but this is what he strongly suspects now and contrary to our Italian fashion wears a loose bodied gown so a, a garment quite useful for disguising pregnancy there's somewhat in it there's something in this I have a trick may chance discover it Discover as in uncover. A pretty one. I have bought some apricocks. The first star spring yields. So this apparently is the old word for apricots. Uh, it, it wouldn't amaze me if one of the reasons it was changed was out of sort of prudery, um, because you can you can see the you can see the word there that that um, the Victorians or or someone might have objected to. So he's bought himself some apricots, which were uh, known to have sort of laxative properties, so apt to bring on bring on labour. Uh, so he wants to use them to see well, see what reaction it gets from from the Duchess. And on come Antonio and Delio, the two friends, and Delio immediately informs us that he's been let in on the secret by Antonio. And so long since married, you amaze me. Just reminding us, of course, that time has passed. I mean, obviously time has passed because the Duchess is looking pregnant. Antonio, let me seal your lips forever, for did I think anything but the air could carry these words from you, I should wish you had no breath at all. Gosh, well, yes, he's, he's, he's quite... Delio is his friend, so it's quite an anxious thing for Antonio to say that he, he um, is contemplating the death of his friend as, as a preferable state of affairs, having having told him the secret. Now, sir, in your contemplation... Oh, the, sorry, this is... Yes, he changes his address here to Bossola, who's on stage. Now, sir, in your contemplation... Possibly because Bossola is eavesdropping. You are studying... To become a great wise fellow. Bossler. So there's a bit of tension and rivalry that starts at this point in the exchange between the two. Oh, sir, 
The opinion of wisdom is a foul tetter that runs all over a man's body. A tetter is a skin disease. So Bottler dismisses the inference Antonio is making. Uh, he's both inferring and then implying um, that Bottler is, well, studying. Um, and Bosselus refutes this idea that he is in any way ambitious. If simplicity directs us to have no evil, it directs us to a happy ending. In other words, he's praising simplicity there. For the subtlest folly proceeds from the subtlest wisdom. Let me, sim let me be simply honest. So he's effectively saying, uh, yeah, a little learning is a dangerous thing. He's reasserting his happiness with a rel relatively low social status and simplicity. Antonio isn't satisfied, though. He says, I do understand your inside. I know what your secret is. Do you so? says Bossler. Because you would not seem to appear to the world puffed up with your preferment, that's his new position. So, because you don't want to appear as if you're pleased with yourself, says Antonio, you continue this out-of-fashion melancholy. Leave it, leave it, cut it out, he says. Bossler. Give me leave to be honest in any phrase, in any compliment whatsoever. Shall I confess myself to you? No, I'm going to be. I'm going to be honest with you here. I look no higher than I can reach. They are the gods that must ride on winged horses. I have no ambition in that area. He seems to be saying those are the gods. They've got to ride on their winged horses. A lawyer's mule of a slow pace will both suit my disposition and business. For Mark me. When a man's mind rides faster than his horse can gallop, they quickly both tire. He's saying, I'm not ambitious. I am. I'm not. I don't have ideas above my station, if that's what you're implying, Antonio. Antonio still isn't convinced. You would look up to heaven, but I think the devil that rules of the air stands in your light. Now, I guess that could be a compliment. You would look up to heaven, but the devil is in the way. Or it could be an accusation. I'm not I'm not convinced. I still think you're ambitious. But the devil is standing in your way. So it's a kind of a double... A, a double statement of suspicion, I guess. Bossler continues. Oh, sir, you are lord of the ascendant. So he's sort of goes on the counter-attack here to point out that Antonio has done quite well for himself. You are Lord of the Ascendant, chief man with the Duchess. There's an irony there, of course. Bosler doesn't know that it's Antonio um, who is with the Duchess. A duke was your cousin German removed. Say, you were linearly descended from King Pepin, or he himself? What of this? Search the heads of the greatest rivers of the world. So he doesn't care about Antonio's lineage, whatever it might be. Search the heads, the heads as in the sources, of the greatest rivers of the world. You shall find them but bubbles of water. They're just fountains, not as impressive as the great rivers themselves. So he's one of using one of Bosler's um, extended metaphors here. He's going to. He's going back on this sort of subject that we're all the same and birth is, we're all born equal. Seems to be the fairly radical idea that he's, um, he's positing here. Some would think the souls of princes were brought forth by some more weighty cause than those of meaner persons, rather than princes being brought into the world through conception and birth by human beings some people some people would think that the souls of princes were brought forth were came into being through some more weighty cause some some more impressive means they are deceived 
There's the same hands to them, for like passions sway them, the same reason that makes a vicar go to law for a tithe pig and undo his neighbours makes them spoil a whole province and batter down goodly cities with the cannon. So the same reason that makes the vicar go to law for a tithe pig, I confess I haven't looked that one up, but it doesn't sound particularly grand, the same passions that make people do these ordinary things makes, uh, makes rulers and princes spoil a whole province and batter down cities with the cannon. Antonio doesn't get a chance to reply to this, because on comes the Duchess and her, her entourage, her ladies. Your arm, Antonio. Do I not grow fat? I'm exceeding short-winded, short of breath. Bossler, I would have you, sir, provide for me a litter, such a one as the Duchess of Florence rode in, a litter as if something to carry her around in. Bossler. The Duchess used one when she was great with child, he says meaningfully. I think she did. Come hither, mend my ruff. Oh, she's talking to Cariola at this point. Here, when? As in, hurry up. When, when, will, you, when, you, when will you have done? Thou art such a tedious lady, and thy breath smells of lemon pills. Would thou hadst one. Shall I swoon under thy fingers? I am so troubled with the mother. It's a difficult line, that. Um, what, what she means is... She is. She's she's hysteric. She's she's hysterical. She's um she's hysterical with frustration at how long it's taking Cariola to um, adjust her ruff. What is the point of this? Well, this is perhaps John Webster's way of of just showing us that the Duchess is moody because she's pregnant. Boss of course takes takes a moment to just aside to us on this um, phrase that she's used trouble with the mother <laughs> i fear too much with the mother and this is so he's there are quite a few asides that he uses at this point and he's so he's building this complicity this relationship with the audience which is well is interesting in itself because the the duchess is the protagonist and the duchess during the course of the play attracts great empathy for and admiration from the audience but bossler is also competing for our interest in in him and so he he keeps up the sort of the rapport with us the audience during this scene i have heard you say that french courtiers wear their hats on for the king so there's just a bit of banter here uh, I have seen it. In the presence? Yes. Why should not we bring up that fashion? So the Duchess, using this as an opportunity again to um, remind us that she is a pioneer and one who, she's not, she's not worried about imitating fashion. She does things because she feels like it, like marrying her own steward. She's not just going to follow fashion. And she says here, so why should not we bring up that fashion? Why don't we do that? It is ceremony more than duty that consists in the removing of a piece of felt. So there's no duty. There's no real obligation for it. It's just ceremony. It's just, it's just people copying each other and making up funny rules. Be you the example to the rest of the court. Put on your hat first. So she says to Antonio, "Go on, put your put your hat put your hat back on." Antonio declines. You must pardon me. I have seen in colder countries than in France nobles stand bare to the prince, bareheaded, and the distinction methought showed reverently. So Antonio is saying, "Well, I, I think it's quite a, I think it's quite a nice custom to take your hats off in front of your, well, your duchess." Beausoleil. <laughs> Possibly has he's not involved here, so he could be doing anything during this exchange. He could be getting his apricots ready, or he could be watching, looking on with suspicion. But he's been quiet for a few lines, and he doesn't seem to he doesn't par participate in this conversation because he then just comes in and he just 
and says, I have a present for your grace. For me, sir? Apricocks, madam. Oh, sir, where are they? I have, uh, where are they? I have, I have heard of, of none, T. Yes, oh, we've had none so far. Bosler with another aside to us. Ah, oh, good, her colour rises. Indeed, I thank you. They are wondrous fair ones. What an unskilful fellow is our gardener. We shall have none this month. Will not your grace pair them? Pair as in cut down the middle. So there's some sexual imagery introduced at this point. The idea of pairing fruit and cutting it down the middle. I mean, particularly with an apricot or a peach uh, or a pear. The, the implications are hopefully quite obvious. The Duchess says, uh, no, I'm not going to pair them. They taste of musk, methinks. Indeed they do. Your sense of smell, of course, is altered when you're when you're pregnant. Bosler, I know not, yet I wish your grace had paired them. I wish you paired them. Why? I forgot to tell you, the knave gardener, only to raise his profit by them the sooner, did ripen them in horse dung. So he says, I wish you paired them because you could then eat them from the middle because they've been sitting in horse dung. The Duchess is onto him immediately. Oh, you jest. You shall judge. Pray, taste one. Antonio, indeed, madam. I, uh, in, uh, so he protests. He said, uh, indeed, madam, I do not love the fruit. So no, thank you. Sir, you are loath to rob us of our dainties. Tis a delicate fruit. They say they are restorative. So there's a bit of bit of flirtation here. Loath to rob us of our dainties is, uh, I think, clear enough in its sexual suggestion. It is a delicate fruit. They say they are restorative. It is a pretty art, this grafting. Now, what Bosler is referring to here is, is the art of crossing species of, of plants or strains of plant with each other, particularly fruit-bearing plants. That's grafting. So he's introducing metaphorically the theme of, of mixing within society. So the, the, the crossing of boundaries, of social boundaries, um, which of the sort that the, the Duchess and Antonio have, have performed. So the, the crossing of social boundaries in marriage and procreation is, is the theme that he's introducing here, grafting. That's, that's just, that, that is something that you probably need to be aware of. It's yet another example of him just dropping something meaningful into conversation and it having uh, almost ominous symbolic presence in, in the conversation. Now the Duchess is a is a fan of, of of this idea. Tis so, a bettering of nature. She's a defender of, of grafting. Of course she doesn't know that he suspects, so she may be having a little joke with herself there, or she may just genuinely believe it. To make a pippin grow upon a crab, a damson on a blackthorn. So he's still talking about grafting there. These are all different types of fruit. Uh, a crab, as in crab apple, not not a, not a crab. A uh, pippin is a fruit. Damson is like a plum, um, and a blackthorn is a sort of berry. And then another aside. How greedily she eats them! A whirlwind strike off these bored farthingales. That's to do with the structuring of. Of her under of, of her clothing. Uh, for, but for the but for that and the loose-bodied gown, I should have discovered apparently, the um the young springle cutting a caper in her belly. So, he thinks he would have had a better chance of. Of finding out, who, who the father is, the young springle, the, the well the youngster. Perhaps because he could have got the timing better if if he would have noticed, and so he would have he might have noticed sooner that she was pregnant, so he he would have been able to find out who the father was more easily, and that that in itself those lines there they they're just a, 
a useful way for John Webster to remind us of what he does and doesn't know. So he's he, he strongly suspects that he's pregnant. He's kind of he's still waiting for the proof of it, but he doesn't know who the father is, and it's it's probably useful for Webster at this point just to remind us of that. I thank you, Vossler. They were right good ones. If if they do not make me sick, and she might well at that at that moment show signs of sickness because Antonio now jumps in and says, "How now, madam?" She there's a strong suggestion that, well, I mean, it's, it's just very heavily implied at this point. She she swoons, um, and this so this green fruit and my stomach are not friends. How they swell me, she says. Um, uh, Bosler says, in another aside. So she, sorry, she says they swell me as in they, you know, um, they make her stomach swell with with sickness. Um, and Bosler, of course, as he's done already in this scene, he he plays on her language. Um, she's swelled already in pregnancy. Uh, Bos uh, Duchess, I'm an extreme. Yeah, I'm an extreme cold sweat. Bosler, I am very sorry. Very convincing. Uh, the Duchess says, Lights to my chamber. Oh, good Antonio, I fear I am undone. Lights there, lights. So they're making preparation to get get her to her bedroom. Antonio. Um, oh, my most trusty Delia, we are lost. So he's in a panic. He, he's not great at keeping his composure when things start going wrong, Antonio. We are lost. I fear she's fallen in labour. And there's left no time for her removed. There is no time left to... Um, to escape, to remove her from from public gaze, or indeed to, to run away. Have you prepared those ladies to attend her and procure the politic safe conveyance for the midwife your duchess plotted? So there have been some plans put in place. Um, I have, says Antonio. Make use then of this forced occasion. So Delio at least has some presence of mind. Make use then of this forced occasion. So make use of this um, this situation that's been forced on you. Give out. Let it be known that Bosler had poisoned her with these apricots. That will that will give some colour for her for her keeping close. So in other words, that will give her an excuse. It will give some colour. It will give convincing colour or reason for her keeping close for her locking herself away. Fie, fie, the physicians will then flock to her. But yeah, if she locks herself away, then the doctors will all want to come and see her. And we can't have that because she's pregnant. Which, in one way makes sense, but in, in another doesn't, because that way that's going to enable the words to get out. For that you may pretend she'll use some prepared antidote of her own, lest the physicians should, physician should re-poison re her, so... Delio just suggesting that okay that'll satisfy the doctors apparently I am lost in amazement I know not what to think on it and that's the end and Antonio finishing that scene quite weakly that's the end of scene one